This podcast is a presentation of UCTV.TV, University of California Television. Like what you learn? Help others discover UCTV podcasts by leaving a comment or rating in iTunes. Uh, we're going to change the topic slightly. We're going to focus a little bit. Initially, this session was described as uh, novel agents for the treatment of advanced prostate cancer. And I just want to point out that you know, at UCSF, for example, we've got 20 trials ongoing easily uh, of novel agents. So there's no shortage of new agents and a lot of them are looking really, really promising. But we thought that for a conference like this, which is really focused on um, decision-making that and, and sort of real-time available drugs, that I would focus uh, more specifically on PSMA targeting because it is here and will be approved shortly. But I just want to point out that when we see patients, we walk through a whole plethora of additional treatment options, um, which are very, very exciting. And I'm not going to be able to touch on them today. So I'd like to first frame this in terms of how we target a prostate cancer. And there's a number of ways. We can look at the genes in it and go after the genetic processes, but we can also very successfully go after a molecule that's on the surface of the prostate cancer. So the ideal target for us is a cell surface protein. It doesn't help us a lot if it's, on the, if it's only on the inside of the cell. It should be present in abundance on prostate cancer cells if it happens once in a million, it may be very specific, but it's not enough for us to target. Very, very importantly, the protein can't be shed into the bloodstream. So PSA, for example, is on every single prostate cancer cell, but it's a terrible target because it winds up in the bloodstream, in the bloodstream, which is how we measure it. And the bloodstream goes everywhere. Excuse me. <coughs> Certainly we want to make sure that this protein is not found on normal cells or at very low levels, because you can imagine that if there's a great protein on the surface of a prostate cancer and we can go after it, <clears throat> but it also happens to be on the surface of, let's say heart cells, that would not be a good thing. We also want to make sure that within a given patient, the majority of the cancer cells actually express the protein. So if half of the prostate cancer doesn't express it in, within a given patient, those cells end up not being treated and it will reduce the efficacy of the therapy. And then finally, we want to be sure that whatever this uh, target is, is that we can link it uh, with an antibody or a small molecule that we can identify it on the surface of cells easily. So let's talk about PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen. And it's the M, the membrane, that differentiates this from PSA. And this is the same list of uh, criteria that I previously mentioned. It is a cell surface protein. So we have a, we have a check mark here. It is present in abundance on prostate cancer cells, another check mark. It's not shed into the bloodstream, another check mark. Now, I think it's fair to say that there is zero or low presence on normal cells, but it is present particularly on salivary glands and to a lesser extent, the gut, kidney, breast. And this has turned up in some of the side effects, particularly of the salivary gland toxicity, which as I'll show you, results in dry mouth and not producing saliva, which can be quite serious. Uh, the next criteria is the majority of cancer cells in a given patient express the protein. That's true in many prostate cancer patients, but anywhere from 30 to 50% of advanced prostate cancer patients uh, may not have a PSMA expressed on all cancer cells. And so looking for those deposits of cells that are present, you can see them on another kind of scan, but aren't PSMA avid is really important to understand. And you've heard already about treatment associated small cell neuroendocrine cancer. Uh, and if you haven't, we'll discuss it during uh, the Q&A. 
Uh, but PSMA is much less present on that, and so we wouldn't be targeting that subtype. And indeed, it can be readily bound by an antibody or a small molecule. So let me introduce you to the topic of theranostics, which is the use of a compound for both diagnostic and therapeutic uh, uh, means. This, the particular molecule that's shown here happens to be PSMA lutetium. Uh, but the way this works is that on this end of the molecule over here on the right, there's a small molecule or an antibody that recognizes the target. The target doesn't have to be PSMA. We'll be talking about PSMA because it's such a great uh, target, but there's others. Uh, prostate uh, stem cell antigen, CD46 is a, a surface molecule that we've identified here at UCSF that we're targeting. So there's nothing magical about PSMA except that we know it's there. It's a good, it's a good target. This end of the molecule over here uh, attaches the payload. And it can be as simple as, well, we'll add a little gallium so you can do an imaging. And that's the PSMA PET scans that Dr. Hope described earlier. Or in its place, true theranostic, you can add in uh, a radio uh, therapeutic actively agent, uh, radioisotope, such as lutetium, yttrium, actinium. There's a number. There's, again, nothing specific about lutetium, except that it's a very good agent for targeting. There are certainly uh, drugs that are called antibody drug conjugates that take an antibody to a molecule, for example, to CD46, and link it to a toxin. In this case, it's something called MMAE. And most excitingly, I think, uh, for the future, is that we're learning how to identify on the far right a target, and on the far left, we link to T cells, the activated lymphocytes. So we bring the lymphocytes directly to the cancer to kill cancer cells. And this may be a very important way of getting at this cancer. So lutetium PSMA is a small molecule inhibitor binding with high affinity to PSMA. Uh, the details aren't important, except it carries this radioactive cargo with lutetium. And this is what the molecule looks like. And it's drawn here as a smart bomb because it is. It gets in and breaks up the DNA and causes cell death, but only in those cells that have the PSMA on their surface. So it's very effective. Now the data from PSMA, our colleagues in Australia and Germany really pioneered this, um, was, began you know, quite some time ago, um, once it was clear that PSMA A could be imaged and then targeted with lutetium. And this graphic on the right is called a waterfall plot for obvious reasons. Each bar represents one patient. Uh, so it's not a huge number of patients here, but you can see them. Um, and what these, this bar looks at is what is the likelihood of the PSA changing or declining? You can see here, this is a 0% change over the course of the treatment. This first dotted line is 30%, and this bottom line is 50% decline in PSA. And I will say that 50% decline in PSA is sort of the metric that has been used to tell us that, yeah, this seems to have activity. It's a signal. And what you can see here um, is that a large number of patients fall to this blue bars, which are the PSA falling by more than 50%. And these are patients that are pretty heavily pretreated that don't have a lot of treatment options. So it really gave us great, great hope that this was an active agent. I will point out that a bunch of patients had dry mouth. It's not severe. This is called grade one and two, but there's also some bone marrow toxicity, probably because this is bringing uh, therapy to the bones, which contain bone marrow. So we have to be aware of that. But these early data led to one of the earlier randomized studies in which PSMA lutetium over here on the right was compared to cabazitaxel. And you've heard about cabazitaxel as an appropriate drug after chemotherapy. And what you can see here, uh, again, waterfall plots, we really want to look at 
uh, the 50% mark, is that there's a significant group of patients, 66%, who benefit from the lutetium, and it's a little bit less compared to the cabazitaxel. Now, this study wasn't really powered to compare these, but if you end up looking uh, at progression-free survival, the likelihood of this cancer being stunned, uh, this is the Kaplan-Meier curves that we've described before, which over time on the x-axis shows you the percentage of patients who have gone ahead and uh, or who have not progressed. And you can see that especially once you get out past six months, this white line, which is the lutetium group, there's fewer of them, uh, sorry, more of them that have not progressed than the green line, which is the cabazitaxel. Still not great, but it's better. And so that was very encouraging. And so I want to show you that there's a number of clinical trials that are out there, company-sponsored, academic. Uh, Dr. Hope provided me with this, with this and several of these slides. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of data on PSMA. Um, the most important of these, because it's the first, <laughs> is the VISION trial. And you may have heard about it already. So VISION was a phase three study, you'll recall from Dr. Agarwal, that's a randomization where you compare patients. And so in this study, these are patients that had climbing, had advanced androgen deprivation therapy resistant prostate cancer. They had to be PSMA positive uh, by imaging. They'd all already received chemotherapy and at least one ASI. So pretty uh, uh, aggressive therapy. And then they were randomized to receive either the PSMA lutetium or whatever physicians wanted to use for best supportive care. Now, this is kind of a win-win strategy because best supportive care is not gonna do a lot for people. And so this is, a way of maximizing the impact of loop PSMA. So it's a very clever way of designing this study to take patients that have been very heavily treated, but that's the downside because they could be beat up. But on the other hand, they don't have a lot of treatment options. So it's an appropriate thing to do. So we don't have any data yet on this, except for this. Uh, this is uh, news by press release. So Novartis announced a positive result of a phase three study. And this is the vision study. And what they said was the vision study met both primary endpoints, significantly improving overall survival and radiographic progression-free survival in patients with PSMA positive advanced prostate cancer. And this is very telling, regulatory submissions in the US and EU are underway. So we're anticipating uh, the report from this at our upcoming oncology meetings. It's slated for a plenary session. Um, so we know it's positive, we just don't know how positive. And we know that it's highly likely that this drug will be approved by the FDA. And in all likelihood, the uh, approval will be based on this trial. So it will come in patients that have already had chemotherapy. So there's some caveats to be aware of. I mean, we're really excited with this. As I've already mentioned, we don't have a perfect biomarker for patients who are most likely to respond to new PSMA. So from 30 to 50% of patients will have PSMA negative deposits and they won't benefit from this therapy. And you know, some uh, centers are combining one type of PSMA imaging with FDG imaging and see if there's discordance. That's been done standardly in Australia and it improves outcomes when you're able to select patients where the majority, if not all of the cancer is PSMA positive. There's certainly some long-term responders, but it's also true, and I've had a number of these patients, that there are some patients with very brief response. The PSA declines and if you're not on the loop PSMA over time, it just goes back up but there are certainly those patients that are really benefited dramatically. We don't yet know how much uh, Lou PSMA actually improved survival. We know that it's a positive study, but we don't know by how much. And then the question was, although this study took fairly extensively treated patients, there's a lot of, there's a lot of treatments out there. And so what happens 
if we use these therapies in patients with even more extensive uh, pretreatment. For example, people who have radiant, which uh, can affect the bone marrow. Um, and we just don't know those answers yet. So here are the future directions. I think really excitingly, this is a study that Vadim Koshkin uh, here at UCSF is undertaking, is there are agents that can be, that we've discovered that you can administer that will likely increase PSMA expression on the cancer cell. It certainly works in animals so far. So that's really exciting. So you can imagine using that and coming back with PSMA mutation. You can also think of combinations of agents with non-overlapping toxicities. And Dr. Agarwal here at UCSF is using PSMA lutetium together with pembrolizumab, one of these uh, immune uh, activating agents. So the combination with immunotherapy. Absolutely, um, vision treated patients after chemotherapy. So we need to think about pre-chemo, before chemotherapy, and even as early as when we are thinking of starting androgen deprivation therapy. We and others are doing studies with a, a drug uh, that uses PSMA binding, but we use another radio ligand called actinium, which has different properties and may be better in some circumstances. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's some very exciting work. Uh, again, we have open clinical trials here where we bind PSMA, and link it on the other end to T cell engagers or T cell redirectors, targeting, bringing the immune system to wherever there's PSA, as well as other surface molecules. You've been listening to a podcast by University of California Television. For more information about this program or UCTV, visit us online at uctv.tv.